awaken. To rouse from sleeping. To stir to life. To wake from slumber. To bring back to consciousness. Awake my soul, wake up, O oh sleeper. Rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake. Awake, awake, rise up, Jerusalem. Awake, awake, Zion, clothe yourself with strength. Awake, north wind and blow. Awake, harp and lyre, awaken the dawn. Awake as in days gone by, as in days of old. For when they became fully awake, they saw his glory. Awesome. So good to see you. I'm glad we get to spend this time together. You know you woke up in a beautiful place today, don't you? You get that? You get that this is one of the special places in the world. As we were driving up today, Dr. Chris was saying, there's just something about Victoria. The sun sits different here. You know, it's like you get more than a golden hour. You get like a golden half day. It's unbelievable. A lot of photographers in the room are making a lot of money thanks to the place you chose to live. It is so good to be with you. It's an honor. And I uh, loved being able to just worship in the room with you last night, hear a great message. And you know, the, the purpose of a conference like this is not a moment of content transfer. It's not just a you know, cerebral kind of stimulation. It is application. We do need to do something. So I want you to think about even that message last night that you heard, what are we going to do with it? How are we going to respond to it? You know, throughout the course of today, I hope your heart and your desire is a response-oriented desire. Like, I'm going to put this into practice. Jesus says that truth sets us free when we live by it. The Bible says that it is possible to read the word and to be self-congratulatory and be deceived by it. And go, like, man, I read so much Bible. And to not actually do what it says, but it's in the doing, it's in the application that truth comes before, or that freedom comes before the day is done. You're going to have a lot of truth to, to sift through, process, and put into practice. But the, the success story of Awaken Conference will be in October and November and January in 2025. And it's going to be in the, the coming days putting into practice what the Word of God says. Amen. Man, well, today I want to share a couple of thoughts with you around a kind of a simple topic, a simple narrative in Scripture that was quite foundational to the, the story of God's redemption and his people. And it's from this simple topic, what do you see in me? What do you see in me? You ever wondered that? Maybe some of you who are in a relationship, you have found a way to, to work that into conversation. You've asked either boldly, or with a little bit of insecurity. Why do you like me anyway? What do you like about me? I don't know why someone like you would want to be with someone like me. And what we're really saying is, can you please tell me what you see in me? You ever looked at a photo of yourself and thought, nah. Nah, that's not what I looked like that day. There's something crazy going on here because I know that's not what I look like. That's not what I look like to me. Have you ever had that moment where you take a photo and, and someone's like, wow, you look great. And you're like, we're not friends anymore. <laughs> you think that looks great? Isn't it interesting that we all have a feature that our eyes go to when looking at a photo of ourselves, and we are sure that every other person also sees that feature? And it's usually something obscure like, oh, why do I hold my eyebrow that way? No one else is thinking about it because they're thinking about how they look in a photo. You take a group photo and everyone's like, hey, can I see? They're not looking at you. They're not looking at the background. They're simply looking, not even at themselves, but at the one feature that they think separates them and not usually for the better, but for the worse. 
Oh man, I did the weird thing with my shoulder again. The thing that no one knows and no one cares about. We think that that's what is seen. You know, I think sometimes we're uncertain of what God sees in us. We're uncertain of what God is actually even looking for in us. We, we can sing a song or, or, or sit in a message or do some study and go, hey, I guess God loves me. I'm not quite sure why, though. I'm not quite sure what he's looking for, though. And we're piecing together what we think God might see in us based on what we see in other people that we're sure God sees something in. Are you following with me? We see a giftedness on someone else and we're like, oh, that's probably what God is looking for. The type of confidence that that person has, I lack that type of confidence. Therefore, I either need to fake it till I make it or conclude that God doesn't see something in me. We see a, an intellect in someone else. We're like, oh, that must be what God is looking for. It's, it's the smart people that God can use or it's the strong people or it's the connected people or it's the people who, who ha have like a, a certain level of charisma. That's who God can use. Well, here's what the Bible says about you and I and what God sees in us. If you open your Bible to the book of Ephesians chapter two, we'll start here, but we're not gonna conclude here today. In Ephesians chapter two, uh, really simply it lays out the process whereby God has selected us, chosen us, and called us close. Dr. Chris made mention to it yesterday. It's a grace story. Paul says this, it's by grace you were saved. It's not by yourself. It's a gift from God. If it was by yourself, then you could boast about it. And the truth is, if we had a reason for God to choose us that is us-oriented, then we, we would boast about it. Our, our testimony story would be like, yeah, there was some darkness going on, but... But all along, I think I was just that type of guy. You know, even when I was sinning, I know I was the type of guy that God's like, I need that on my team. And that's why he called me. Well, that's not anyone's story. It's by grace we've been saved. It's not of ourselves. It's a gift from God. And then, uh, you know, Ephesians 2.10 says this, for you are God's masterpiece. Can you turn to the person beside you and say, you're a masterpiece. That was easier for some of you to say than others. And I watched some of you, and I said, turn to the person beside you, you turn this way, and then I said, say you're a masterpiece, and you said, sorry, and you turned that way instead. I saw that happen. You're like, I can't say that this way. I'm gonna say that this way. The Bible says that, that you are God's masterpiece, and you've been created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he planned for you beforehand. You're a masterpiece of God, and his planning has meticulously gone in, not just to where you are today, but to the works that you are yet to do that he's been thinking of before now. So in this, this one text, we see past, we see present, and we see future. In the past, God was thinking about the works you would do. In the present, you're his masterpiece. In the future, you're going to do the works that God had always been planning for you to do. In the Greek, this word masterpiece is the word poema, which is the, the word from which we derive poem. You are the, the poetry of God. You are the creative written work of God. You are the, the handiwork of God. He is ready to unveil you to the world around you. You're God's masterpiece. So what does God see in you? A masterpiece. A masterpiece of his grace that is gonna make a difference in the world around you. But don't get it wrong. The thing that he will use to make a difference in the world might not be the feature that you think it is. Have you ever heard someone say, oh man, if that person would get saved, they'd make a great Christian. It's usually about a celebrity or a rich person or a person who has like a natural sort of leadership gift or, or natural following. We're like, oh man, if God could just get someone like that saved, if only Ryan Reynolds would come to faith, he'd make a great Christian. We, we say things like this. We, we muse with things like this because we think what God is looking for is a talented person he can use. And yet, if you look through the consistency of scripture, what we see is this. God uses the foolish things in the world to make a difference. In Jeremiah, it says this. Oh, don't let the... The wise brag because they're wise. Don't let the rich brag because they're rich. 
Don't let the, the strong boast because they're strong. Instead, let this be your boast, that I know and I understand God. So maybe today, we're the poor, the foolish, and the weak. But there's still something that God sees in you. And the thing he sees in you is a masterpiece. And the thing he sees in you, if you would uh, let him use it, will actually bring a difference to the world around you. So, so if we were to take a, a photo today, let's take a picture together. Let's take a picture together. Uh, how many people used to take selfies? But now you take point fives. Anybody? Okay. I know some of the youth are away, but some of you showed your, your youthfulness. We're like, no, we don't do selfies anymore. We do, we do a point five. Can we take a point five together? Are you ready? Ready? Everyone smile. Well, that's a good one. That is a good one. It's a really weird picture of my arm, that's for sure. Something about the point five. It's a strange way to see your own arm. But yeah, if you were to look in this, you would zoom into yourself and go, nailed it. Got the face I was hoping to get. Some of, some of the rest of us might go and go, oh, did the thing again with my lip. Why did I do that? Everyone notices it. But the interesting thing is when you take a, a photo like this, you take it instantly, and then you instantly can judge, and you know you've done this before, where you look and you go, ah, let's do another one. Let's do another one. I, I don't see the things I want to see. And we think sometimes, perhaps spiritually, that, that God is going through his reel trying to find a picture of us that would be worth him using. That he's kind of going through like, no, nah, not that one. Yeah, did the weird thing again. Well, if we think around our, our, our decision making and our morality, when we think around our skill sets and our giftedness, it's like God goes, oh, yeah, no, not using that, not using that. Can we take another one? But, but it's probably linked a little bit to the immediacy of the time. Now, I'm not going to become a critic of, of technology. I'm grateful that, I, that we all carry with us computers in our pocket. I think it's cool that we all have the ability. You know, they, they say, um, I, I think it's something like 1.3 billion photos are taken every day, and 95% of them are on a smartphone. It's something, something along those lines. That, that, that globally, like, we're taking moments and we're capturing moments, but most of them are in this format where you get it and you look and you go, nope. Or you get it and you look at it even worse and you go, yeah. It's a funny thing to do spiritually. You're like, oh, yeah, God could use this. But, but we used to take photos this way. If you could help me out, Sam. How many people have a, have a, a film camera? You don't have a film camera? Come on, we're going to take a little photo here. This one is a little bit too fancy. It doesn't have that nice sound, but we'll, we'll still get the click. Are you ready? Come on, everyone make, make, make that face. Here we go. Oh, wow. That might be a good one. I don't know, but it might be. It's possible. If handled correctly over time, if I need to see it now, I'll destroy it. If I need to see it now, I'm, I just got to know. And I open it up and look, I'll destroy it. Because I actually need a moment of exposure followed by a process of development. And I think what God is looking for in you and I is that we'd have moments of exposure, but that they'd be followed up by a process of development. See, see, we could be lied to or, or deceived to think that I'm going to go to the conference and then my life will be changed. A conference is about a moment of exposure. Life is about the process of development. And, and, and Pastor Pepe and Leah's heart is not what we need. Is everyone to come to conference and get changed? What we need is a moment of exposure in the grace of God. For some, even in worship today, you're like, that was my moment. God spoke to me. For some, before the day is done, God is going to speak a word into your life. But what is needed is the process of development. So the thing that God sees in us actually becomes the thing we live up into. You're God's masterpiece. He's created a good work in you. But, but how many people know there's a process of development to get there? Let, let me give you an example from Scripture. Let's look at David, okay? David. King David. In, in Acts chapter 13, 22, speaking of David, it says this, that God chose David, a man after his own heart. He would do everything that God asked for him to do. He chose David. He selected David. He saw in David what, what the, the heart that he needed. 
to do the things that he had called him to do. I wonder if as God looks at our hearts today, he goes, there's a heart that I could use. I am convinced from scripture that that is the case because it's the heart that God is looking for. So let's look a little bit about that, uh, at that story. If we had more time, we could go more in depth, but I'm gonna give us a version that contains some brevity. Let's look at the, the story arc of David's life. There's a man named Samuel. Samuel's a prophet. And uh, Samuel is told by God, you need to go and, and find the next king. God really speaks to Samuel with clarity. How many people would love for God to speak to you with real clarity? He goes, Samuel, I'm going to tell you the place. In fact, I'm going to tell you the family. Go to Bethlehem, find Jesse's house. One of his sons will be king. So Samuel goes, I got lots to go on there. I know the, I know the location. I actually know the actual household. I got, I got plenty to go on. And and, and from here, I think I can go with my instincts. So he gets some oil to anoint, and he heads to Bethlehem, and he goes to the house of, of Jesse, and he goes, hey, hey, uh, are you Jesse? Jesse goes, oh my God, it's Samuel. I don't know how he would know it was Samuel, because there was no photos, there was no you know, social media, but, but there was maybe an air about Samuel. He's like, oh my, it's, it's Samuel. Babe, 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 Samuel's here. She's like, tell him just to wait outside a minute. I got to tidy some things up. And she's scrambling to get the house ready. And, and he goes, so Samuel, what, what brings you to Bethlehem? You know, some sacrifices or maybe just a little visit? He goes, actually, no. God's told me one of your sons are going to be the next king. He goes, babe, <laughs> babe, we're royal. Our boy's going to be king. She says, I always knew. From the first time I laid eyes on him, something special about our boy. He goes, come on in, Samuel. Samuel makes his way in. And he goes, so, so you have sons? He goes, do I have sons? Let me tell you. He goes, bang, get a liab. She puts a liab in his best clothes and gets ready. She goes, liab, this is the moment. You've always been my favorite. And a liab walks out and man, a liab is tall. He's dark. He's handsome. I've brought, brought for you a living illustration of what that might, okay. <laughs> and Samuel says this, I can see it. I can see it. There's something about this guy. He's got, got some riz, I can see it. I can see following him. Look how tall he is. Because tallness, that's definitely one of the things that's important in a leader, right? Because I, I could see it. I get the sense that Samuel's like, he's reaching for the oil and then God just kind of nudges him and he goes, that's not the one. Not him. Awkward moment. <laughs> Awkward moment when Samuel has to say, so Jesse, hey man, Eli, you seem like a great guy. Honestly, a great candidate. We're just gonna, we're gonna be interviewing a few other candidates. Uh, do you have any other brothers? And very quickly, Jesse goes, hey, do I have more sons? I'm a son-making machine. <laughs> next. And out comes next, and as he's coming out, mom goes, you were always my favorite. Don't forget it. And then next son comes out. Not quite as tall, not, not quite as handsome, but Samuel's like, yeah, you know, a little bit of a fixer-upper, but we could get him there. We could get him there, give him some time. And again, God nudges him and says, not this one. How about, how about a third son? How comes the third son? And then the fourth, and then the fifth, and it's getting awkward. Samuel might be questioning for a moment. It, this is Bethlehem, right? I'm getting a little old. And you are Jesse with a J? Yeah, okay. So they get through seven. He goes, so do you have any other sons? Jesse goes, no, that's it. Do you, want to, do you want to see the first one again? He goes, well, I, I mean, there's Dave. But Dave's kind of like, he, he's a son. He's just out in the field, you know. And Jesse goes, well, why don't you get, get Dave? The older brothers are like, Dave? I hardly even know that kid. They go out and get David. David comes in from the sheep. David stinks. You know, I've heard lots of sermons where people give like interesting descriptions about sheep, their level of intellect, how their wool reacts to water and why. You know, it's good that it goes by the still water. It's nice that the, the shepherd would, would lay them in the green grass. The truth is, sheep stink. <laughs> David comes in, he smells bad. 
He's not nearly as tall. He's not nearly, he's just not the guy. You, you got to imagine the brothers are like, we've, we've now heard it seven times that it's a no. This is an easy no. But, but the Lord speaks to Samuel and he goes, this is the next king. And he says, Samuel, man might look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. What does God see in you when he calls you and he sets you apart? He sees heart. He goes, here's a guy who's got a heart after me that I can use. And so in front of all of his brothers, Samuel opens up the the flask of oil. It would have smelled beautiful. In In a time and an era where water was scarce and bathing was a luxury, and you gotta imagine that, that maybe if you're the eighth, you get the leftover water at the end of everyone else's bath. Stinky old David is in the room and, and Samuel pours oil on his head and he, he's got this fragrance that fills the room. And all his brothers are standing by going, this is crazy. This Samuel guy, I thought he was a real prophet. This is crazy. There's no way that God is calling Dave. Anyone feel like maybe you're Dave? That maybe if the outward appearance is what God was looking for, you know know you're not the first choice. You might not be the second. You might not be the third, that you're somewhere way down the list. What an interesting defining moment in front of all of his brothers for God to say, there's something about David I see. There's a heart after me. And, And so he pours on oil and Samuel essentially goes, okay, well, see you later. And off he goes. And the room is kind of still and quiet and it smells fragrant now. There's this perfume around Dave. He's kind of wiping the oil out of his eyes. His brothers are are grumbling as I imagine brothers would do. And then at some point, Jesse goes, well, Dave, the sheep ain't gonna watch themselves, buddy. Back out you go. We know from the narrative scripture, he goes back to the thing he was doing. How is it possible that God could see kingship in David and yet David was sent to do a menial task? Well, a heart that looks like God's is developed in obscurity. David had to go back into a place of obscurity, back to the the sheep. The Bible says that the sheep know the voice of their shepherd. I imagine they would also know the smell of their shepherd. And from a far way off, they smell something different coming into the pasture. And there's David, he's like, wow, it's been a big day. Lamb chops, want to hear about my day? No, you're a sheep, okay. So no one wants to hear about my day. Okay, this is great. It's great. Man, Eliab had a crazy look on his face when I became king. And in obscurity, David, before the Lord, in quietness with no fanfare, God's just developing and working on his heart. For some in the room, you feel like you're in a season of obscurity. It could just be that God is testing your heart. What can obscurity test in our heart? It tests our humility. Imagine the the shift in the narrative. David comes from the field and and he gets anointed as king and God says, you're the next king. And then David goes, so Eliab, you can come and kiss uh, kiss my ring real quick and then you go watch the sheep. I'm the king now. Oh, he had a heart still to develop. He was just a kid. And so in obscurity, he develops his heart after God. We get to read into some of it in the Psalms. We see a frustrated, emo, you know, unfit person. We see throughout the the, the course of David's life, a continual process of growth and development. We see a heart that is not perfect in any sort of way, but it is tested. And God is molding and he's shaping it. For some in the room today, we're in a process of development. God, in obscurity, is working on our heart. And we think, man, I'm ready for the big stage. Come on, get me out on the big stage. I I know I'm called. Great. I think we've all been called according to the grace of God. If you're in Christ, then you are called. And and what he saw in you was a heart that was committed. But he's developing that heart. Don't open the camera too fast and try to see it now. You'll destroy the good works that God has planned in advance for us to do. But that's not the only test. The humility in his heart was being tested, a weird walk of shame sort of thing that day to go back to the sheep while smelling like a future king and try to process the emotions of the day. But David was also tested in other ways. Before too long, the nation was at war. 
And we know how young David must have been because it was only the three older brothers who were part of the fighting men. So of the eight sons, three were old enough to be considered men and the rest were still their juniors. And David is the youngest of all of those. And as the youngest, his father says, hey, Dave, can you go and make a delivery? Leave the sheep. Honestly, sheep watching is a pretty annoying task. Sheep can watch themselves. Um, Go to the front lines if you could. I got some bread and some cheese I want you to deliver. I think the Bible's funny. Just describes this cheese. So we know this. We can derive this. The brothers were not lactose intolerant, okay? Very important scholarly fact that we know about David's line. He delivers cheese to his brothers, and he's on his way to to the, the field of war, and he's perhaps expecting to see some combat, but when he shows up, all he sees is a giant. He shows up, he goes, guys... I've brought Havarti. Let's have a party. (laughs) What's happening? And and out comes this giant, a giant who's intimidating and who, who, who speaks blasphemy against David's God. And David's like, this is going to be awesome. One of these guys is going to go kill that guy. And nobody volunteers and nobody steps up and everybody backs away and everyone's intimidated. And David's like, Hey, where's our hero? Who's going for us? And, and they won't make eye contact, and they're all kind of awkward around it. And so finally David goes, well, I can, I can take this guy. If you want, I could just go kill this guy. And they laugh, and they're like, okay, kid, just go take your cheese to the, the brothers here, you know. His own brother is like, you're such an idiot. He actually says this, you have an evil heart. It's funny that God thought David had a beautiful heart a heart that looked like his, a heart that he could use. His brother saw evil in his heart. He goes, oh, you, you just wanted to come here and see war and see people hurt. You don't get the real world. And David goes, hey, I've killed a lion. I've killed a bear. I can kill this guy. Now, now just a quick pause here. If I had ever killed a lion, <laughs> I'm just going to graduate myself out of being a shepherd. I'm going on tour. I'm a lion killer now. You know, I'm coming back, I'm like, hey, dad, watch your own sheep. I just killed a lion, dude. I would figure out a way to work out my lion killing story into every conversation. <laughs> Someone would be like, wow, beautiful day today. Like, yeah, it reminds me of the day I killed a lion. You know what I mean? He killed a lion. Where did he learn to kill a lion? In obscurity. God just testing his humility. But the second test we see in David's life is, is this, the test of opportunity. When opportunity arises, David says, yes. Where others see the impossible, David saw an opportunity. Where others were backing down, David was running towards it. What is the test of opportunity? It tests the courage of our heart. So obscurity tests our humility. Opportunity tests our courage. Can we stand up and put ourselves, now don't get it wrong, David, it wasn't swagger. It it, it wasn't uh, overestimation of self. I don't think heaven was scrambling and all of a sudden they're like, oh my goodness, David really got himself in. We gotta go bail this guy out. There was a quiet confidence about him, a real genuine courage in his heart because he stands up before the giant and he goes, hey, you come before me with weapons. I'm just gonna stand in the name of the Lord. He had an accurate courage about himself and courage is testing opportunity. Some of us right now, God is developing our heart through opportunities And we're backing down because we feel intimidated by them. Maybe we need to press in and show some courage in our heart. Perhaps as God develops the courage in our heart, we will begin to see what he saw. So David steps up. We know the story. Even if you've never been to church, you know the story. David versus Goliath, the classic story of the underdog versus the, the ultimate warrior. David sees victory that day. And all of the sudden, things change for little Dave. All of a sudden, the king steps in, the king trying to consolidate his power over David. And he goes, David, have you met my daughter? I think you should marry my daughter. David goes, hey, who am I to marry the daughter of the, daughter of the king? I'm good. Maybe she wasn't that good looking. We don't know. But what we do know is Saul was simply trying to consolidate power. What he saw is a whole group of, of intimidated men who saw a little kid do something aspirational. He's like, what am I going to do? Because soon they're going to see what, what, what we can evidently see, this guy's a great leader. And so what happens is David becomes the, the focal point of a pop song. Imagine a pop song in a time of no streaming. 
Imagine a pop song in a time where you could not share songs and he becomes the, the, the caricature in a pop song that is sung around the world and became, or around that, that known region and became popular where they said, Saul has killed his thousand, but David has killed his tens of thousands. Let's be honest, he had killed his one. Truly. Like he went on to other, other exploits, of course, but, but it was that one defining moment of, of incredible courage that led to this song that was being sung. And, and, and what happens is this, the crowds loved him. But the one person that could have actually spoken to David's life as a mentor hated him. The only person in the nation who had ever been a king was Saul. David would be the next one. The only one who could ever show him the ropes would have been Saul. And Saul hated him. Saul hated him so much that in multiple occasions, while they were hanging out together, Saul grabbed a spear and tried to kill him. Now, I don't know about you. I got a one spear policy, okay? <laughs> Try to kill me once. I think I'm just going to leave. Physically. Although emotionally, I've stayed in some multiple spear environments. Stay in some toxic places where spears are thrown on more than one occasion. And what happens here is David's heart is being tested through opposition. For some of us, maybe today, we're in a season of opposition. Interesting thing about opposition is you can usually tune into one side or the other while being opposed and hated. He was also being adored. The crowds loved him. But there was this one voice that hated him. How many people find it easier to focus in on the one voice of the hater? And opposition is, is testing David. The opposition grows to such a place that David actually has to leave. What does opposition test? Well, it tests our integrity. It tests our integrity. There's this opposition that comes against us that goes, hey, if I just, if I just capitulate from a core value, then I'll be loved? Is that all it takes? See, for David, all it would have taken, just marry his daughter then. Just align with him then. The opposition gets so significant that, that David actually has to flee. He has to leave. He leaves his home. It's wild to think. He leaves the place that he was said he would be king. Sometimes opposition makes us question, am I even called? I'm not seeing the effectiveness of the call that I had. Am I maybe not even called? Maybe Samuel was just going a little crazy. Maybe the, the grumbling of my brothers was right. Maybe I am just the runty kid. Maybe I am just that. Now, now listen to this. The only way David could ever become king is if Saul died. And typically, the person who killed the king kind of got first dibs. So while in opposition, Saul chasing David, looking to take his life, David has an opportunity where he's in a cave, Saul is in the cave, and all his friends are like, dude, kill him. This is the time. And then you fulfill the prophecy, it's perfect. It's just lined up perfectly. But David, instead of killing Saul, just kind of takes his keys. He goes, I'm just going to take this. The next morning, Saul wakes up. He goes, where did I leave my keys? Anyone in the room relate to this? You forget things around. Saul's like, ah, I left my stuff somewhere. And David, from a distance, he knows how far Saul can throw a spear. He stays just outside of that range. He goes, hey, Saul, just so you know, I could have killed you but I'm not going to. What is he saying? He goes, you may hate me. I will never hate you. You might want to destroy me. That is not going to change the heart that I have towards you. It's not happening. We're not in a mortal battle together because I don't hate you. What does opposition test within us? Opposition tests our integrity. When we are opposed, there's usually one or two changes we can make to the core value of who we are that would shortcut the process. David could simply have taken Saul's life, and you know what would have happened? Every person would have said, David's the new king. Well, why is he new the, new the new king? He killed the king. Long live the king. But David goes, man, if God's the one who called me, he pulled me out of the field, then God's the one who can get me to the throne. I will not let my heart be distorted by the opposition that I'm facing. Some of us who are under opposition today and what it is causing us to do is develop a hard heart. The message of scripture is really clear that we ought to keep a soft heart. Thick skin, soft heart. Thick skin that is able to withstand, but we're gonna keep a, a soft heart. There was a moment of exposure for David 
before his brothers, I wonder if he was questioning, am I ever actually going to be king? Will there ever be a better opportunity than I had in the cave last night? I'm not sure if this is ever actually going to happen because all that's happened since is my brothers don't really like me and I'm constantly in battle and the king hates me and now I'm not even in the nation that I'm supposed to be the king of. The opposition got so severe, he had to leave the country. He finds himself one day fighting for the, the enemy. To keep safe, you can read this story. It's followed by a beautiful psalm, but the story is this. David is in front of a king. He's like, I'm going to die if I don't pull out a trick here. And so he starts drooling down his beard, and he pretends to be insane. Like, he, he, he feels abandoned. He feels alone. Some of us feel that way today. We're like, I think God called me. I remember this time I was at a conference. I was young, and, and I had this moment. Someone laid hands on me, and they're like, you're called of God. And so I got all excited, but it has not gone that way. I thought God wanted to use me. I don't see the results at all. Maybe today in worship or last night in worship, you've found yourself asking, like, God, what are you even seeing me? I could never do that. I can't lead worship that way. I can't speak that way. What do you see in a person like, like me? Maybe I'm not called. Hearts being tested. Obscurity tests our humility. Opportunity tests our courage. Opposition tests our integrity. Number four, and lastly, David's heart is developed through ownership. So now he's gone. He's out of the the country. He's not even in the place that he was supposed to be the king of. You're called to be a leader. Nobody's following you. Awkward. You're called to be significant in the whole nation. He can't even remember. I remember what it was like to be sung about. It was kind of cool. But I'm supposed to be a king. I got no, no kingdom. And then in that that season, a group of people who the Bible says are indebted and beleaguered, they come and follow him. There's like a couple hundred of them, and they're like, hey, man, I know the the, the king hates you, and we don't sing the song about you anymore. It's kind of outlawed, and you don't even live here, but you can be our leader. (laughs) David's like, oh, thanks, guys. What an opportunity. (laughs) Amazing. So what do you bring to the table? I don't know. I'm really indebted. They hate me too. He's like, cool, 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 cool. If you look into the, the, the group, some of them were like David's cousins, his family members, his friends. And you know what David did really interestingly? He didn't say, this is, this is lame. I'm not doing anything until the, the crown is on my head. He goes, well, I'm going to start here. For some of us, we simply need to just take ownership of where we are right now. Say yes to the thing that God is calling us to do right now. It might not look very kingly, but say yes to it. It might not look very very royal, but say yes to it. It could just be that God is developing the, the heart that looks like his through the process of ownership. What does ownership test? It tests vision. It tests the vision. Paul, uh, David could remember, I remember being called to be king. I remember visualizing what that would be like. I was telling the sheep. Then this one day while I was telling the sheep, a lion came out. I killed him. I killed a giant. I, I, I walked with the king. I was like the person people sung about. I had that moment. I could have just taken it into my own hands. And now I've got a couple of hundred of losers that want to follow me. Is this it? And David simply takes ownership. He's like, all right, all right guys, we'll, we'll do this thing together. That group of guys, my goodness, Awkward group, kind of crazy. If you look at some of their stories, there's one guy named Benaiah. The only thing that's really told about him is he killed some people with a club and one day he went into a pit with a lion on a snowy day and killed that lion too. They're courageous, but they're kind of erratic. They, They took on a name. They became a gang. I think they had gang jackets. Their gang was called David's Mighty Men, which is really awkward. Hey guys, what should we call our club? I got it. Joab, what is it? We'll be David's mighty men. And David's like, I was was supposed to be king. Oh my goodness. I'm stuck in this group of dudes. What are we doing? But what's it testing? There's no possible dotted line that goes from in a cave with indebted dudes to being the king. What was it testing? It was testing vision. And for some, you're like, man, I'm called to preach. I'm, I'm, have the opportunity sometimes people show up at our church like hey man anything you need help with I'm like that's awesome what's your name again they're like yeah that's my name hey if you ever need help on stage I'm really good on a mic I'm like cool 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 awesome hey you know what we just like to get to know you be a part of our team 
We had this one guy, one guy told one of our pastors, he goes, hey, just want you to know God has called me to be your armor bearer. I'm with you heart and soul. And we're like, oh, that's awesome. That's a really like churchy thing to say. Oh, great. And he never showed up ever again. Ever again. I think what he was thinking is he would go, I'm your armor bearer. And then we'd go, oh God, it's what we've been called for. We've been waiting for you. Wasn't willing to go through that process of ownership, just saying yes to something small. I want to encourage you, for some, you feel insulted by the smallness of what is being presented to you. Just say yes to it. Take ownership of it. Let let that vision within you be tested that God can get you where God needs you to get. There is no, you know, the map quest printout to get you to where God needs you to get. He's going to do what only he can do. He saw something in David that day and he ends up getting him to the kingship. If we did a little study, we would find that the, the day David was anointed in front of his brothers was not his only anointing. Because when he was with that group of guys, David's mighty men, they're like, hey, we may not have a kingdom, but we got some oil. We're going to anoint you our king. And in a little group of people, they're like, you're still our guy. And they put oil on him again that day. And later, when eventually, through God's plan, Saul lost his kingship, the nation called David, and for a third time he was anointed. And each of those times, a reminder of the person God that God always saw. You know what's cool is when he became king, all those guys went with him. They were his bodyguards. They were over armies. They were over legends. It could just be that the group of people around you right now are the people who are going to go that whole journey with you. Wouldn't that be awesome? Just take ownership of what God has brought you now. So how do we apply this to our life? Let me bring this to a conclusion. You see, some of us, we think what God sees in us is great potential based on our strength, our intellect, our giftedness based on our connections or our charisma. Maybe we think that God looks about the room and he's like, oh, there's a talented person. Imagine what I could do with them. But what God is actually looking for is our heart. And we look at a picture in a moment of exposure and we're like, oh, I don't know what God sees in me. I'm telling you, God sees our heart. In fact, one of my favorite scriptures in 2 Chronicles, it says this, that the eyes of the Lord are searching about the earth for the hearts of those who are committed that he might come and strengthen them. It's not the other way around. God is not searching about the earth for the strong that he might captivate their heart. He's looking for hearts committed that he could bring strength to. All God's looking for is a heart committed. I'm believing today two things are gonna happen. One, for some people in the room, this is gonna be your moment of exposure. I'm audacious enough to believe that some of you in years in the future will say, there's this conference my church did. And you know, I wasn't quite sure why I went, but the churros were awesome. And it was good. The worship was great. Some of the speakers were good. But I had this moment with God and he he spoke to my heart. He said, I'm going to use you. And I just have held on to that. And throughout the the seasons, I've held on to that. This is going to be an exposure moment. And for many of us, I believe what's going to happen today is God's just going to begin to strengthen that heart of conviction, to strengthen that resolve to say, God, I got really very little to bring to this equation, certainly nothing to boast about. It's only going to be your grace. But I dare to believe that I might just be your masterpiece that you have created good works for. And so you're going to have to do the work. You're going to have to mold me, shape me, break me, bend me, and do the things you need to do in me to see the results that you wanted to see in me. But one thing I can control is the consistency of my heart. Lord, you have my heart. Crosser, would would you bow your heads today? I want to pray with you. You see, the eyes of the Lord are searching about Victoria today. And we might think God is looking for the tall, dark, and handsome. We might think what he's looking for is the thing that everyone else kind of sees. But what he's looking for is the heart. Kind of grateful that God doesn't look for features we can't control. There's nothing about your features that gives God the ick. He's simply looking for a heart that's committed. So with eyes closed, heads bowed. This moment's going to be more between us and God anyway. If you're making the statement, God, my heart's yours. I don't know what you can use in me, but, but you got my heart. 
If that's your desire, wherever you are, would you just stand up in the presence of God? Just acknowledging it. You got my heart. There's something humbling about it. We might even feel like, oh man, if I stand and then my chair squeaks and the person beside me goes, who do you think you are? This is not about strength. This is not us presenting. You see, none of us in eternity will stand in the presence of God and say, God, you're welcome. You're welcome. I brought my strength to the table. We'll all say thank you. We'll all be overwhelmed that he could use something in us. And what it begins with is a heart. May our hearts be exposed to the grace of God today. God, in your kindness, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts today with clarity and gentleness, I pray that you'd speak to hearts in the room today. You are called. You are chosen. You have a heart that God can use. And some of us, because we've listened to the cynics, we've focused on the the voice of the critic, It's like there's an assembly of our brothers around us saying, come on, her, him. For some, because we, we are influenced by the crowd, we see courage waning and lacking in others and we're like, oh, who, maybe, maybe I can't. For some, the painful opposition of somebody that we just simply needed to believe in us and we didn't get it. It's like a spear and we just can't get over it. Come on, today God's softening our heart again. God's gonna do what he's gonna do. Let opposition test our integrity. They might hate you, don't hate them. They might be against you. You don't have to be against them, just be for the Lord. For some, what we're doing, what's happening in our hearts, we're saying yes to God. We're taking back that condition that we've put on our yes. We're taking back the the list of conditions and we're saying, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. It's a yes for me. God, it's a yes for me. God, it's a yes. Whatever you're calling me to, it's a yes. It might be small, but it's a yes. It might be embarrassing, but it's a yes. It might seem beneath me, but it's a yes. It might be too hard for me, but it's it's a yes. It might, might test my weaknesses, but it's a yes. God, you can use me. You can use me. Lord, as your eyes look about the earth, may you see in the room today hearts that are committed to you. May there be a moment of exposure that we hold on to and we do not forget that sustains us through the testing of our heart. Lord, you have my heart. God, you have my heart. God, you have my heart. And would you deeply imprint on on the, the film of our lives this moment We are called according to the grace of God. It's not by our works. Nobody else is getting credit from this story but God. Nobody else is getting credit for the story but God. In the immediacy, people wanted to credit David with killing the giant. It was the Lord who killed the giant. I want to credit David with, wow, so humble. Man, it was God who worked out his humility. Read the Psalms. David was not naturally humble. He had to let God do some deep work. God, you have our heart. May it be soft, may it be repentant, may it be pliable, moldable. Use us, God. Use us, Jesus. Come on, if you can make one thing your prayer today, just simply this, God, you got my heart. My heart is yours. My heart is yours. My heart is yours. My heart is yours. I wish I could tell you today that from this moment of exposure to when everyone sees it happen will be a certain number of days, weeks, months, or years. I don't know how long it will be. I promise you it will be a process. I promise you it'll feel a little bit longer than you want it to feel. And then in retrospect, you'll go, how did God do that much work that quickly? How does a heart get developed after God? We just keep having these moments. God, you have my heart. When we feel overlooked, man, I'm laying that down. God, you have my heart. When we feel intimidated, God, you have my heart. Work courage out in me. When we feel opposition, I'd love to say after 
42 years on the planet, nothing affects me anymore. Oh, it still hurts. But God, you have my heart. I'm not going to let hate towards me turn into hate that is retaliatory. God, you have my heart. My heart is yours. My heart is yours. My heart is yours. My heart is yours. Well, that's all that we have for you today. If you like the message that you just heard, don't forget to like it. Let us know your comments below and share it with as many people as possible. Please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and our website. And if you're in Victoria, BC, Canada, we would love to see you this upcoming Sunday. God bless you and see you soon.